Statistics professors are 99% confident that they can induce sleep in an introductory statistics course by lecturing on z-scores. Get it? Z sleeping. And we're going to talk about z-scores in today's lesson. So first, before we do that, let's go ahead and revisit percentiles. And the definition, I want to make sure you have the right one because there was an older one, but the College Board recently revised it. So a percentile is the number of points at or below the value. It used to be just below the value and now they are revising it to the number of points at or below the value, which is actually kind of a good thing and I'll explain why. Divided by the total number of points times 100%. So if you're the very top person, every score is at or below yours, so you're at the 100th percentile. Okay, so um, the reason I like the revision is when I was doing relative frequency, and let, let me go ahead, I've got this dot plot that shows the number of miles I hiked over 30 days while I was in Spain in 2017. So you can see I had some short days and I had some long days, one day pretty much to 19 miles, yay. So anyways, um, I'm going to go ahead and look at the relative frequencies of each of these dots, which I went ahead and put in intervals of two miles. So uh, two to three miles, we only had one dot. Four to five, there's that dot. Six to seven. So that's where these frequencies come from. The relative frequency is going to be that frequency divided by the total number of data, data points. Well, I have 30 data points representing 30 days. So one over 30 is 3.3%. And I don't have to calculate it again. Then I have 2 over 30 is 6.7%. 1 over 30 is again 3.3%. 3, 3 over 30 is 10%. And well, let's go ahead and leave the 10%. I'll tell you that 7 over 30 is 23.3%. 9 over 30 is about 30%. And 3 over 30 is still 10%. Now the cumulative relative frequency is really with a new definition like the percentile. So if I look at the cumulative relative frequency for miles two and three, I include all the points at or below. So one divided by 30 is 3.3%. So the percentile for that is 3.3%. Then uh, let's go ahead and add miles four and five. I only had one hike in that category. So I double my 3.3%. Technically, it's probably closer to 6.7%. And then I have the 13.3% here when I add the 6.7% uh, to this one. And then when I add it again, it's roughly 16.7% because I'm getting some rounding on the threes up. So what does this 16.7% mean again? Let's just recap. That means that uh, by mile nine, 16.7% of my hikes are at or below that value. Well, let's go ahead and look at the dot plot. So there's one, two, three, four, five. And if I take five divided by 30, that should give me about 16.7%. I add another three points, another 10%. So that'll just add up to 26.7 then 36.7 when I add these I get 60 percent. Now by the time I get to miles 16 and 17 all but three of my points are at or below those values so I will have 27 out of 30 which is 90 percent so that's the 90th percentile right here. And then finally uh, when I get to the very top 18 and 19 I hit my hundredth percentile. So what percentile is the day that I hiked 15 miles? I would add up all these dots right here, count them all up, and then divide by 30. Or I could just go ahead and look at this and say it's at the 60th percentile. So you can actually make what's called an ogive or a cumulative frequency graph. It always starts at zero till you hit your first value. So we go here, zero to one, I don't have any values. Then by the time I get to three, it's 3.3 percent. So there's three. At five, I'm at 6.6 percent. So it goes up a little bit more. Then 13.3 percent, 16.7, 26.7, then 36.7, then 
then all the way up to 60%, then 90%, and finally 100%. Any point after that, it flattens out. You can't have anything over 100%. So if I wanted to look at the 15 miles, I could actually look here and say, oh, that's at the 60th percentile because 60% of my values are at or below 15 miles, which is right there, okay? Now, how about the day I hike three miles? Well, that would be this point right here. So looking at the graph, I would say, oh, uh, this is roughly, it's under 4% because if I divide these by five, I've got 4% on every one of the grids. Or I can look at the table and say it's 3.3%. Now to interpret the 60th percentile of a distribution, I'm going to go ahead and look up 60th percentile, or I can look at it, the graph here. When I hit 60th percentile, that's at 50, 15 miles. So 60% of my hikes are at or below 15 miles. That's how you interpret a percentile. That percentile covers all values equal to or less than the value that corresponds to that percentile. Now there are examples of good high percentiles besides my hiking. Test scores, always good. Batting average, that would be great. Bad high percentiles, weight of a person, sadly I know about that. Number of speeding tickets, luckily I don't have that problem. So actually not just luck, I just don't speed. All right, so standard deviation is a ruler. So we're gonna go ahead and get into a measure um, called a z-score and IQR, we, we knew that to measure spread. We also knew range, and it's great. But what if we want to know if a point is more further away than we expect, or what percentage of data falls between two points? The standard deviation is a way to measure these things. And so we bring in a standardized, standardized measure, which is the number of standard deviations away from the mean. This is known as the z-score. So um, first of all, what we're going to do is calculate, um, we've got two people, uh, Laura and Mike, and we're going to compare how tall they are compared to their groups. Laura is 72 inches tall, Mike's 77 inches tall. Now, if I were to say who's taller compared to their averages, that's different than just saying who's taller, because Mike is clearly taller, but is he really that tall compared to his group? So for adult males, for example, the average height is 70. And for females, it's a little bit shorter at 65. All right. So when you look at it, they both are about seven inches taller than average. Okay. But what I really need to do is take into account spread because like the heights of males, we have a broader range. So it's not that unusual to be a little further out. The heights for females, we tend to be a little bit more compressed on that spread. So what we're gonna do is figure out how many standard deviations above average each person is. So I'm gonna take for Laura, for example, she's 72 inches tall. The mean is 65 inches. So she's seven inches above average, but I wanna convert that to standard deviation. So I'm gonna actually divide by that 3.5, which gives me this, and I can say that Laura is two standard deviations above the mean or the average. I can do the same thing with Mike. He's 77 inches tall compared to 70, and the standard deviation is four inches. So when I divide that out, I get 1.75 standard deviations above the average. So who's taller compared to their group? Based on the spread, Laura seems a little further out in the population compared to Mike. So Laura is taller compared to her group. Now we have, let's go back to, we're going to revisit the z-score. So first of all, it measures how many standard deviations the point is away from the mean. You take the distance, so it's the value minus the mean over the standard deviation of the value. Take the distance, which is the value minus the mean, and divide it by that standard deviation. If z is less than zero, the point is below the mean. If z is above zero, the point is above the mean. Let's revisit this cool app where we can see the actual data live and how the numbers change. So here we are with my points. And before we looked at the difference between the point and the mean. So if the point was lower than the mean, the difference was negative. If the point was higher than the mean, the difference was positive. 
Now to find the z-score, all you do is take this value, in this case negative 6.6, .6, and divide it by the calculated standard deviation. So 4 goes into negative 6.6, uh, negative 1.65 times, roughly. I'm sure it's rounded. And as I move it around, so if I take this point and I move it further below, what happens to the z-score? It goes down, right? As I move it up and it gets closer to the mean, the z-score is getting closer to zero, becoming closer to positive until I get to the other side. And you can see that the z-score is all the way to positive. So it's actually more than one standard deviation away. And I can get it less than one standard deviation away and then back to the negative side. So just looking at these z-scores, you can tell I have a point at two points that are below the mean, and I have three points that are above the mean because they have positive standard deviation scores. Which one's the furthest away from the mean? Well, based on the z-score, it looks like point A is the furthest away from the mean and then point E, which kind of makes sense based on the picture. So let's go ahead and do an example. Amy scored a 1740 on the SAT and Maria scored a 30 on the ACT. So standardized scores are great because you can compare uh, values that aren't exactly corresponding. It's the first time you can compare apples and oranges. Very exciting. Remember how all your life in math, oh, you can't compare apples and oranges. In stats, you can. So. The SAT scores, we'll call them our apples. So for Amy, Amy's z-score is going to be her score minus the mean, which is 1,500 in this case. And um, the standard deviation is 240, so we just divide it by 240. Her score is one standard deviation above the mean. Maria has a score of 30 compared to the average of 21 and divided by 6. Marie's, uh, Maria's z-score is one and a half standard deviations above the average or the mean. So based on this, Maria is standing out a little bit more compared to the SAT scores than Amy is. So Maria scored farther above her group on a standardized level than Amy did. Now my mom has a height of 4 foot 11. So what would be the z-score for my mom's height? Now remember, I'm using the same values we had before, the 65 inches and the 3.5. Well, her z-score would be 59, because that's what 4 foot 11 is, minus 65 over 3.5. So minus 6 over 3.5, negative 1.71. So she's almost two standard deviations below the mean. What does it mean that her z-score is negative? That means the values with low average. And about half of z-scores are negative. I mean, I'm not going to say exactly half because you could have this mean median thing going on. All right, let's do another example. We're going to compare temperatures in Umayat, Alaska. I'm probably mispronouncing that. In Ohio and Hawaii. So in a, let's look at Alaska first. We want to know uh, their average temperature is 28, standard deviation of 10. Their temperature last Friday was 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and then in Hawaii, the average temperature is 80.2 with a standard deviation of 2. And they had a temperature of 77. So which location had a more unusually cold temperature? Well, the z-score for our Alaska location is 20 minus 28 over 10, which is negative 0.80. We get the 20 minus the 28 over the 10. Then for Ohio and Hawaii, it's going to be the 77 minus the 80.2 over 2, which is negative 3.2 or negative 1.6. So it was actually more unusually cold in Hawaii than it was in Alaska. Now you can actually go back and find a raw score or a value based on a z-score if you know the z-score, the standard deviation, and the mean. So remember, uh, the z-score tells you how many standard deviations above the mean you are. So if you have the standard number of standard deviations and you know its width, then you can actually say, oh, I'm this much above or below the mean. 
And then just to figure out exactly where you are, add in the mean, which gives us this um, basic formula. Z score uh, times a, a standard deviation. So the number of standard deviations times the standard deviation gives the distance from the mean and then add the mean to find the location. So here I have um, backpacks on the Camino de Santiago and let's say the average weight is 14 and a half pounds with a standard deviation of 1.5. I carried a very heavy backpack when I went hiking and I would say my standard score or my Z score was four and my friend, Mrs. Pierce, up here, she had a very light pack and her Z score was negative 2.5. So can we figure out how much each pack weighs? Sure. I am four standard deviations above the mean. Four times 1.5 is six plus 14.5 is 20.5. For her, this is gonna turn into a subtraction. It's gonna be negative 2.5 times four plus the 14.5. So when I work it all out, I actually get 10.75.